ago, I, I think I hoped for this in some way, uh, this community. So I hope I can contribute a small piece uh, and set the tone, and I can't wait to see what the actual artists do. Um, a map. I've begun with a definition from the dictionary. is a diagrammatic representation of an area. Yet maps are a combination of real representation and pure abstraction. As such, they have a special fascination. That a map, or for that matter, even a group of maps, cannot duplicate the infinite variety and complexity of reality has been a fruitful subject for literary and artistic imagery. The imperfect nature of maps stimulates fantasy and imagination, leads to frustration, aids and sometimes hinders decision making, depending on why each map was compiled, the purpose for which it is being used, and the experience and skill of the map, ma map maker and reader. The oldest existing maps are those found on clay tablets depicting Mesopotamian cities more than 5,000 years ago. Both ancient Greek and Chinese civilizations compiled maps during the last two centuries BC. These cartographers' maps of the earth have changed drastically over the course of humankind once depicting blocks of territorial unity surrounded by its water, they then became distinguishable continents and within them distinct states, regions, and political borders for mercantile exchange and war making. The earth once flat became round, and when we landed on the moon, our worldview once again took another leap of enlargement as we saw it as a spherical orb of mass blue water and land for once a whole without separation. Maps stimulate travel and adventure. In Don Quixote's Cervantes commented that one can journey over all the universe in a map without the expense and fatigue of traveling, without the suffering and inconveniences of heat, cold, hunger, and thirst. This might remind us of hours of childhood spent lost in atlases, whispering to ourselves, when I grow up, I will go there, and may speak to our primal nomadism, the ones who need to roam. Imaginary maps have also provided the basis for whole novels. Twelve books and more than 30 stories take place in a county invented and mapped by the very mind of William Faulkner. Ross Lockridge's mystical Rain Tree County is similar, though located in an actual place, Indiana, is so complete and alive that it could have very well existed. There are countless stories, from Treasure Island to the fantasy world of Middle <coughs> Earth and Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, made of made-up geographies. Along with topographical maps, there are mental maps. It is often hypothesized that the structure of mental representation is map-like rather than language-like. Perhaps when we speak of the symbolic mind of archetypes, we are actually speaking of maps. Ben Blumson describes a map as a thing the mind already knows. Jung described archetypes similarly as a living preparedness, facultas preformandi an a priori possibility of perception. There are important kinds of geographic knowledge which cannot, which cannot be communicated, except very awkwardly in the natural language. Consider the problem, how to describe a place. For a number of fundamental reasons, information about a place is more easily done by means of mapping than by speaking or writing. Maps are better than linear language as they can communicate large sums of information in a condensed manner. The same could hold true for describing psychological states, and perhaps why we are so indebted to the arts to help us express such inner landscapes. Our internal environments seem to yearn for the vocabulary of both a geographer and a poet to adequately grasp our position. How often do we say, I feel like I'm on the edge of a cliff, or looking into the dizzying abyss, or climbing a mountain, stuck in a ditch, at a crossroads, lost my way, where is my compass? Such expressions often arise when we are not in the known territories of our experience. The term map is frequently borrowed to convey the idea of clarification. Map out your plan of attack. Do I have to draw you a map? The fact that there seem to be fewer expressions for certainty, like I feel like I'm on solid ground or on top of the world, perhaps speaks to our lack of imagination once we master our surroundings. When we know where things are and what is at the center, our need to search ends. Yet certainty poses its own danger when we do not question our own accuracy. In 1154 in Sicily, the Arab cartographer Ash Sharif Ali Drisi made maps sketching, uh, stretching from the Mediterranean to the south of India, centered on Mecca. 
and positioned with the south on top. These maps can appear unrecognizable until turned upside down. The Europeans had the world as a circle centered on Jerusalem, and the Mediterranean maps were oriented with the Orient on top. Map content can be manipulated to essentially promote certain viewpoints. Mercator's famous maps of the world that sit in every elementary classroom give a totally distorted view of the areas of the world's land masses in relation to one another. It used to be the United States was sometimes placed dead center. North, American, uh, North America appears larger than Africa. Scandinavia larger than India, though it is less than one third its size. Nonetheless, Mercator's projection has formed a cart cartographical worldview of many generations. To actually see what the world really looks like is actually very disorienting. Mm -hmm. These maps or others from unusual perspectives serve to emphasize the biases of their makers. Map content reflects the map producer's perceptions of importance, their worldview, and system of values. Maps cannot be both revealing and complete. Thus, the mapping process is one of evaluation, selection, and emphasis, which leads to simplification of the detail and the intricacies of the real world. Or as Lewis Carroll Riley observes, an accurate map would be too true to be useful. Since the exact duplication of reality is impossible, a map is actually just another metaphor. One may argue the ultimate metaphor or the ultimate archetype. Yet this begs the question, how deeply self-centered is our cartography? It was only within the Renaissance of the 15th century that the Europeans began to create a more accurate world map and worldview even though Ptolemy's description did it 1,300 years earlier. It began uh, by knowledge that they gained through trade links extending as far as Sri Lanka. Their so-called voyages of discovery helped break their ethnocentricity. Unfortunately, discovery and colonization can sometimes be one and the same. Like many after them, the expansion of the known world was made with the help of the geographical knowledge of indigenous peoples that were being discovered and then enslaved or destroyed. Think Christopher Columbus and the Native Americans. The genius of the Europeans and later their power was said to be based on their ability to collect together dispersed maps from different cultures of the world, leading to a global European mercantile capitalism. Our minds or inner landscapes too can be such voyages of discovery, where the known world enlarges as more of the unknown is made conscious. An uncovering, while typically thought of as a process of growth and profit, as described with real trade, may too, it may beckon the annihilation of our own indigenous mystery. A supervisor once taught me not everything needs the light of day or to be mapped and capitalized. We must be careful not to turn ourselves into conquistadors. For young, the unconscious is never fully understood and never fully surveyable. He regards consciousness as having arisen from the unconscious like an island that every night disappears again beneath the waves. From this perspective, we might then learn to embrace our need not to know and to get lost. Performing life not through our orientation, but through disorientation, it might produce a more imaginative perception of where we are. Herman Melville said that maps are always lying and true places are never there. The map maker asks the map reader to believe that it is real, and to read a map, one needs imagination. But this also goes both ways. How often do we think our mental maps are the real thing, only to discover reality to be quite different? An excerpt from Josephine Tay's The Man in Q. Until late at night, he poured over the map until the country grew as familiar to him as if he had known it. He knew from bitter experience that the very best map reader had to suffer some severe shocks when he came to face, face to face with reality. For this is the gift of our disorientation. How many times in life do experiences or traumas come and upend our worldview, revealing our realities to be entirely different than perceived? Or perhaps have two people looking at the same object or experience map it quite differently? Both of these accurate maps, equally as accurate, or rather inaccurate, merely using different vantage points. Disorientation as both spatial and psychological experience is the feeling of utter disaster and the delicious flavor of getting lost. As if lacking a center of gravity, an artist too must surrender control and start to create 
without fixed purpose and experience this utter disaster and delicious flavor of getting lost. Rather than try to protect themselves from the sense of disorientation, we must embrace disorientation as necessary. Peter Elbow reminds us that things have actually got to change and you must experience this as chaos. Conventions previously mastered will fall apart when we grapple with new ideas. The geographies of disorientation are diverse and many. We can get lost in all sorts of places, forests, cities, virtual environments, labyrinths, illnesses. The labyrinth is an archetypal image, um, as an archetypal image has resonated with the human unconscious since antiquity. And although the idea of the labyrinth is ancient, it has nevertheless remained vital for thousands of years in the minds of so many different people and cultures throughout time perhaps because it retains this power to engage the unconscious, including its sense of mystery, encounter, paradox, and transformation. I sometimes say that in the word amazing is the word maze or amazement. Um, I used to have um, a patient that drew mazes all the time. Um, and we would say amazing. Ultimately, the terror of getting lost Ultimately, the labyrinth is about the terror of getting lost and never found, or never reaching the center. A common nightmare of our humanity is wandering errantly around a maze of long passages. Literary, literary travelers since the time of Odysseus get lost and find their way back home. These stories do not claim that we are all hopelessly lost and unable to return to our origins. Rather, they demonstrate how our disorientations never lead to new discoveries, only to a series of uncanny returns again and again. The word nostalgia, coming from the word nostos, does not mean sentimentality, but a return to our origins, a homecoming. Beginning with the Greek epic and myth all the way to romantic fairy tales, heroes have traditionally dreaded losing their way. Odysseus held on desperately to his nostos, Theseus unrolled carefully Ariadne's thread behind him, and Hansel and Gretel dropped pieces of bread to guide them safely home. Getting lost signifies the end of one's homecoming, as well as a mortal danger, being turned into swine, devoured by a minotaur, or eaten by a witch. These narratives are only initially about getting lost. They are also about the triumphant moment of redirection, the topographical aha experience, the right turn toward home. If anybody knows how to get out of a labyrinth, you just go right, 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 or left, 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 or up to get perspective if we had wings. So the trick is to remind us to gain perspective. And sometimes, if we cannot gain perspective, the clues rise up to meet us, much like the thread and the breadcrumb. Or how about the opposite? What of those who never seem to be sufficiently uprooted, never lose their way at all? A travel writer, W.G. Seabelt, is heralded for being able to close the gap between going and staying, traveling and dwelling, producing the sensation that the traveler, no matter how far away he's traveled or journeyed, he never really actually left home. More disturbing than the fact that we might always be lost was for Seabold the fact that we might always know where we are. Whether we like it or not, finding ourselves in the same hotel in a city one, we once visited long ago, when we become disoriented only to keep circling back to the same spot, when we move away from our homes only to see our past creeping in everywhere around us again. The persistence of the familiar, this unheimlich, this inability to lose one's way, haunted Siebold's early narratives. In Vertigo, the narrator wanders aimlessly through the streets of Vienna, hoping to disorient himself along goalless paths, only to discover, disappointingly, that not one of his journeys had taken him beyond the known city center. In this paradigm, the subject never gets lost, and rather, he's incessantly returning against his will to hauntingly familiar places. In these cases, disorientation led not, as the ancient myths, to the excitingly strange, but rather to the unsettlingly, unsettlingly known. More than just losing our way topographically, we can also lose our way morally or spiritually, as in the lost sheep who in the Gospel of Matthew stray from the way of God. Here, going astray and wandering becomes a mistake, 
the ultimate paradise lost. There are also psychological consequences of exposing ourselves to unfamiliar environments. Children in, strangers, in strange situations, that's a little experiment we used to do to children, still do. <laughs> when removed from the mother's safety as home base, some will show immobilized behaviors accompanied by a dazed expression seemingly signaling a lack of orientation and distress. Nervous breakdowns could be seen as a form of mental lostness. And as I said, nostalgia was actually originally a diagnosis given uh, to Swiss mercenaries fighting away from home who literally died of homesickness. Or madness, psychosis, is someone who has been away a long time and cannot find his or her way through the jungle anymore, who cannot see connections, only disjointed signs. Madness can also mean to move rapidly impetuously or aimlessly. This is not only not to know where one is, but also not knowing who one is. In today's modern world, madness might be redefined as never being able to get lost. There may be a wholly new pleasure for the perils of getting lost in a time where geotagging and GPS threatens to rob us of our insanity and the labyrinth um, can be used to imagine the concept of the net and the world wide web that we will never be able to not find our way through. All we have to do is Google it. Um, for a moment, turning our attention from the category of maps to the category of mapping, to think of mapping as a kind of behavior that has existed across human history and culture, um, researcher Robin Storr has actually tried to search for its emergence in children, asking whether this is a natural ability, a habit, or a faculty, much like language acquisition is natural. In fact, from the end of the 19th century, researchers have attempted to understand whether humans can orient themselves, much like whales or birds or other creatures. Do we, too, have an innate capacity to navigate our world, our experience, or will we always need technology? Take the example of those who just naturally know how to find their way home, the homing pigeon. No, end here. You can dispatch a pigeon from a shipboard in the middle of a snowstorm over the North Sea, and if its strength holds out, it will infallibly find its way home. To this day, no one knows how these birds sent off on their journey into so menacing a void, their hearts surely almost breaking with fear, and their presentiment of the vast distances they must cover, and yet they make straight for their place of origin. These pigeons become pilots. Think back to times in your lives when your digressions became straightened out, when you became instinctual, pilot-like. Or like Frodo and Tolkien's trilogy, began to feel re restless and the old path seemed too well trodden and you started to look at maps and wonder what lay beyond their edges. In risking the adventure, we turn the margins into a new center and thus make disorientation a new form of orientation. And here we upend the traditional opposition between home and away, and away becomes our new home. So that's it. What sharpness is. Dear blind prophets, dear halos drawn around Byzantine saints, dear apologies, dear methods, Dear sacrifices on bed frame, on dining table, on the wall the light touches last. Dear shallowest parts of the river, dear wanderers of bright, complicit dangers, dear sable nights, dear atoms of us, dear foals bearing their first lung in the old wood, dear parents, dear brother and sister, dear to the broken parents, dear what got us here? Dear, what makes us remain? Dear, I had to sit up for this. Dear, leaving. I had to waste every future where we were still a family in the fire with which I love. Dear, phones ringing around the smoke-cleared room. Dear, sighs at the ends of messages, meaning I don't know what I did. Dear, deeper. Dear, instinct somewhere. Dear sick willow dropping each yellow leaf to the same wind. Dear caller, 
map what I want. Dear islands and anchor blue water. Dear lion at the resurrection. Dear not giving up, though we are so far away from each other. Though what we had wasn't a love, but a trick the eye plays on strangers. Though we danced, we found the music hard. What I cannot say is how before the sighs come, I can tell they will come. Like the one errant hoof the horse makes a show of when shaking off the flies. Dear flies in every version of hell. Dear rope around my waist, holding me to the mast. Dear fly dark storm, I can tell you approach. Dear approach, be done with it. I shouted along the deck for all the sails to be drawn. I took down the laundry of me from where you might hit first. And now I'm waiting. Now I wait, axed as ever.
environmental conservation. And um, my task there was to research topographical maps, looking for places that might be remediated. Um, so I discovered that all of the boroughs of New York have to have an office of topography. Uh, and places like Manhattan have really amazing archives, but um, other boroughs I called, um, one borough specifically that I will not name, um, and I said I'd like to come check out the maps, and they said, oh, we don't actually have any maps. And I said, so what do you do there? And they said this, we answered the phone. Um, so I like to think about that like when I'm on LinkedIn or something. It's somebody's job to maintain a non-existent map archive. <laughs> um, so this is called naming. <clears throat> Ladies, gentlemen, non-binary, sentient beings of both an incarnate and disincarnate nature, welcome to Babylon 2063. We, as a decentralized network of consciousness, have built a body of language and concepts that far surpasses our conventional mortal envelopes. As such, we hope you will join us in celebrating the release of a new emergent property. Agora, patent permanently pending, is a product of our liminality and anti-structure division, hovering at the edge of the known universe, at once everywhere and nowhere. Morphogenetic in nature, Agora promises to surpass the limits of materialist ideology with possible side effects, including the mind perceiving itself as other, culminating in an experience of complete transcendence of space, time, and matter. Please enjoy the snacks and Agora samples provided, and keep your viscera peeled for sensory stimuli indicating the presence of the undulating rhizome of synaptic connection, the non-local sands of time, and the four seas of potential nowness some of the most breathtaking and non-conceptual wonders of the Seven Gates. Thank you for joining us. We will now begin our descent into the underworld. Wanting, wishing, worrying, hoping, fearing, dreading, desiring, envying, comparing, strategizing, judging, complaining, self-pitying, striving, anticipating, expecting, contriving, hedging, rationalizing, clinging and doubting, slowing, resting, allowing, allowing. Upon passing the threshold, a deafening cacophony ensues, the sound of a hundred thousand honeybees grinding electric gears as consciousness comes into being and fades away in waves. Passing through the spheres, the array of possible futures lays spread out in all directions, emerging from the heart center of the luminous body and landing smack dab at the zenith, the axis mundi, a kiss that ignites an explosion in your emotional core, summoning sensations of a bliss enmeshed with both joy and sorrow. All opposites pan out and ride the labyrinthine course of potentiality, ultimately uniting and swallowing each other whole. I get it now, you think but the perspective unhinges from any such sense of I and permeates the environment. For a moment, you feel as if you can touch everything that has ever or will ever exist. And then an itch, calling as if from within a deep fog. Resisting, hastening, clinging and doubting, rationalizing, hedging, contriving, expecting, anticipating, striving, self-pitying, complaining, judging, strategizing, comparing, Envying, desiring, dreading, fearing, hoping, worrying, wishing, wanting. Thank you for joining us at this atemporal juncture in space-time. We do hope you enjoyed being reincorporated into the undifferentiated void by the archaic mother. Good night.
image of the Creighton Labyrinth. Um, it was designed by Daedalus for Minos, the king of Crete. Um, there's a controversy over uh, the original site of the Creighton Labyrinth among scholars. Um, some, some say that the original site is at Knossos, an ancient city on the island of Crete, and uh, others place it at Gortis, um, elsewhere on the island. And beneath Gortis is a, uh, a vast system of caves. Um, this, the system of caves is accessible only by a small crack in a rocky hillside. And uh, once, once you enter the caves, or once you enter the crack, the crack opens up onto this uh, spiraling network of caverns. And the caverns have smooth walls and columns, uh, which indicates that they were at least partially crafted by human hands. Um, as uh, further evidence for the case of Gortis, there's a 16th century map at uh, Christ Church in Oxford. And on the map, um, right at Gortis, is a strange uh, labyrinthine symbol. So I'm um, in favor of this theory. And I, I like the image of Theseus uh, fighting his way out of an underground labyrinth. I think it provides a really interesting counter image to a, a different tale, which is uh, what happened to Daedalus, the, the designer of the labyrinth, a little later on. He was banished by Minos, the king of Crete, to a tower. And so, so we have the, the image of the tower uh, against the image of this embedded labyrinth underground. And uh, I, I, think, I think what it is, is the difference between the cartographer's perspective, um, which is an elevated perspective, and it, it sees the ground below it um, already as a system of points and directional lines, as a map. Um, as opposed to the experience of being trapped inside of the labyrinth, where one is, in a sense, um, lost inside of experience. And uh, I'm thinking now of, of Orly Athens' excellent introduction and her notion of disorientation. And so I like, I like the image of the, the subterranean labyrinth. Um, up against this image of Daedalus trapped in his tower after designing this incredible mechanism of torture. Um, and so in the tower he, he discovers his own other sort of torture, which is uh, the impossibility of ever being lost and always having a vision of what's coming next. Um, and so my question is, what would it be like to live in both? Um, I myself would rather not have God presiding over my frontiers. But it's good to know that the position is available. Um, I, could, I could ascend, I could ascend to it perhaps, if I were to think myself as far away from, from the present as possible. And then I could see myself like I see a framed picture, and uh, I could step out of the frame as one leaves an open door. And then I could look back on the picture and uh, see myself in the picture um, amid all the objects around me and then I would notice 
that the objects around me are in fact nothing more than ideas I had just had, crystallized into ordinary odds and ends, uh, half-remembered dreams of sublime love and uh, laborious meditations on the nature of human consciousness and epiphanic discoveries as to my true intentions as an artist. All spread out on a tabletop like polished bric-a-brac. And I think this is a rock. The concept hurts. Bite that thought into a blood formula. Thus begins a sluice race down. Train the items to wonder where they slip to. A felt well of ocean rimmed in brush. Find the bottom of the body. It is waiting on a pang of wood. Think hard. Rest on rocks. Let your flesh hang. <laughs> now you are a common animal. A common animal looking on, a common animal looking on and on, and on your muddy foot you see a clean mark, <coughs> a hairline crack where the last line snapped, suspended from the balmy tree cover, the letters loosen falling down around your claws into the wet rot of forest. The common animal with a fractured foot nestled in leaves, looking on as the book breaks down. In the musky wood, watch the face of your beloved book as it relinquishes volition. Watch the taut binding soften as you let your eyes settle. The book breaks the show once it sees the common animal is looking. On the warm forest floor, words want to be watched. You shiver in your fur as the letter settles with you. See its fine displayed angles sink into your look. See tack falter as it lights upon your ear, <coughs> and the Spanish moss, the drinking pool, the lily pads, the beetle husks, the oak stump, the fern patch, the bed of shale, the sparrow bones are starting to break down. We should remember our lovemaking in the woods before it's frosted over. So let me begin to collect the dim traces of this presentation. As it stands, what I see is only a mountain of blurred acorns tumbling onto a row of obfuscated chairs. The ripped surface of the forest hides the trees that sheltered us, scattered with the murky remains of a well-attended exhibition, faded to an obscure site of wreckage littered with illegible books, shreds of paper piled on three-legged tables with splintered side supports, warped wooden surfaces tip downward as bric-a-brac slides to the floor. 
sonic devices with digital components lie disemboweled. Valves and sockets wrenched from their settings. Cables peeled and stripped. Dampers, hammers, bridge pins, key pins, knobs, jacks, and pickups. Pick up a part and chuck it.
I was sleeping on the mountain top and spent by the years my body was lovely. Deep in the Hellenic night the centaur paused in his quadruple race to spy on my sleep. It was a pleasure to sleep in order to dream and to seek the other lustral sleep that eludes memory and cleanses us of the burden of being who we are on earth. Diana, the goddess who is also the moon, saw me sleeping on the mountain slowly descended into my arms. Gold and love in a night ablaze. I pressed fingers to my mortal eyelids. I wanted not to see a lovely face. My lips of clay were profaning. I breathed. I breathed in the fragrance of the moon. And her in fin mint voice spoke my name. Oh, the pure sought after cheeks, O oh, rivers of love and of night, O oh, the human kiss, intensed bow, I don't know how long the bliss lasted. There are things not measured by grape, or flower, or garden snow. People flee from me, afraid of the man who was loved by the moon. Years have passed, and inner anguish brings horror to my sleeplessness. And I ask myself if that tumult of gold on the mountain was true. Useless to talk.
tell myself that a dream and the memory of yesterday are the same thing. My solitude wanders the ordinary roads of earth, but I always search the ancient night of the spirits for the daughter of Zeus, the indifferent moon. Worrying about feeling inconsequential. To bear the yoke. I have been standing with the wild horses of your worry. Standing still in the fog, I have been star-side when the stars mistranslated how still you could stand for something about certainty and knocked you down. I have a secret. You're not the only one struggling. There is a tribe of us like work horses in the fog, like gathered marigolds in the hand of a man with a bluer eye for ruin. We all have that man. He rides the horses to hurt them. He is the zodiac knocking. You have been managing, but it is a tough job. No fog lifts without making way for more weather. A secret sea must inhabit you, a grammar which cannot translate to a tamer animal. You position yourself as if you've been working this whole time. You hold on because you must. 